All right, so welcome to uh, your, your um, of course, you're expecting today, which is labor markets with search frictions. This is the first lecture, and it's an introduction to the material of the course. Um, this is a master's course for people who are um, probably at the end of their studies or getting close to the thesis stage. Um, We'll start with some administrative details, and I want to try to make this more interactive course. Uh, there will be a video version of this that you can watch on YouTube or on the, on the, the Moodle page, but um, the idea would be to give you more of a, an option to ask questions. So if you ask a question, you're anonymous, but you can talk uh, freely, and uh, I'll try to answer those questions. So that's something I'll talk about in a second. It does make sense maybe to watch the current video version of the video online, so then you can get prepared for it. I won't give these slides beforehand, so it really pays to come to lecture. I want to make it worth your while to come here. And I'll talk about the role of labor markets um, in general, and then I'll talk about the fact that a lot of people's activity in the labor market is, is a discrete zero-one type of decision. Do I participate? Do I work? Do I not work? Do I look for a job? Even though we think of the demand for labor as being a continuously measured object, like a labor demand curve or a labor to supply curve, that's one lens for looking at the labor market. But there are other ways to look at the labor market, and that's um, part of this lecture. And one of those discrete possibilities is you might uh, have the state of unemployment, which means you don't have a job and you're, you're looking. You could also be unemployed and not be looking. And I'll make a distinction between those two possibilities. And then we'll, we'll uh, delve into the course, which is about thinking about frictions as the source of these discrete possibilities. So I'm really delighted that so many people are coming uh, for this because it's, um, it's one of the weak, it's one of the Achilles heels of, of, of macroeconomics in general, but also in, in, uh, in particular labor, in labor economics. We, we, we tend to be a bit schizophrenic sometimes. We think of uh, unemployment as being uh, an individual affair, and in fact it is, but then we also try to group people into a group of, un to a pool of unemployed and think about that pool as being a source of inefficiency. And those are two possibilities that are both kind of true, but they have tension with each other, and that's the idea of this course. And in the course of the this lecture, I'll present the Pissarides model, which is an introduction to this idea. It's a really easy entry into the world of what we call search and matching or labor markets with search uh, frictions. Frictions being not being able to get what you want right away for some reason, okay? So when you finish this master's program, you might get a job very quickly. Um, maybe you won't, and that thing may, that that outcome might depend on macroeconomic events and, and, poss and possibly on macroeconomic factors, but it also may depend on you. And that's um, part of the fascination uh, that people have with this. Okay, so the Pissarese model is the bottom, is the bottom line. So let's, let's, um, let's start by just thinking about labor markets in general. Labor is really important. It's a production factor. It goes into the generation of GDP. Without labor, not much happens. You don't have firms that are just consisting of, of completely of robots. I mean, there's usually at least one person running the show, um, usually a lot more people. And uh, the remuneration, the, the payment to labor, is a huge chunk of GDP. So a lot of people who aren't economists don't get that. They look at their own company. They look at their own uh, boss and say, well, the guy that owns this company must be really just really cleaning up. But if you add all the the inputs and outputs together and look at who's really responsible for this, it's, it's labor. Okay, at least 50%. Most countries, well into the 60%. Developing countries tends to be a little bit lower. Um, and in advanced countries with very strong uh, labor unions could actually be at the higher end, 70%. Okay, so the, counting this properly, it's not just wages and salaries, it's wages, salaries, what else? What else goes to labor that firms have to pay for? Yeah. Benefits. Unemployment insurance contributions. Not the benefits, but the paying to the government, so the government has a pool of resources to pay to other people or to save it. Uh, health insurance, 
big deal in, in Europe and uh, even in the United States, but often it's done on a private basis in coordination with the, with the firm. So all that goes to really is a cost of labor. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. So labor share is high, more than 50%. I just checked it for Germany. If you use the GDP as the, as the numerator, um, it's around uh, 50, 52%. If you use national income, and if you remember your macro, national income is not equal to GDP. It's when you subtract a lot of things like taxes, indirect taxes, um, and you end up getting a number like 65%. Okay, so that's an interesting fact for you to remember. Labor is traded in decentralized markets. So when you start looking for a job, you're not going to go into a, an auction hall and someone's going to bid for your, for your work. You, you have to do some work to get the work. You, know, you, have to do, you have to interview with people, talk a lot, and go through an assessment center. And sometimes you get disappointed. Sometimes you get several job offers. Right, that's part of the process. Um, and contracts are voluntary. We don't have slavery, thank goodness. Right? So you, you can agree um, to work for somebody, or you can not agree and walk away, or you can sign a contract that binds you in some legal sense for some time. Um, it's all voluntary. So that's a very important part of this, uh, the way we think about this. And working hours are different from oranges, tomatoes, steel, um, primarily because the hours have a quality that depends on the person that's doing it. So that's, maybe that's true of oranges too. The trees have a different quality, different fruit, but a lot of times the, the quality is not observable before or even during the time when the hours are being rendered. Okay, so I mean I can see that, that Jacob is doing a great job right now because he prepared this, this uh, session quite well, but you know, um, if I come in here, we've signed the contract, I come in here and there's nothing been set up, you know, I might be a little bit disappointed and he's still getting paid. Right, so that's part, of the, that's part of the reality of labor markets. A lot of times the, the employer or the purchaser of the, the service isn't around all the time to control or check, see what's being done. And of course, labor is changing. So the labor we would talk about 10 years ago in this course or 100 years in this, ago in this course is just fundamentally different. Maybe a lot more physical activity, lifting stuff, pushing stuff. Uh, making judgments about where stuff goes or deciding how production takes place. And now we're, we're more automated. Decisions tend to be a, of a different nature. Some decisions, less so. And of course, um, a lot of services still involve physical labor. So the healthcare system has a lot of physical labor. You know, just being there, picking people up who are being cared for, transporting people around, etc. So that's, you know, unemployment is part of the story. So people who aren't working um, may not be working for a number of reasons. And one of them might be because they, were, they lost their job involuntarily. That's one possibility. But there are many others. And these are all confounded in some sense. It's very hard to distinguish, right? It's very hard to know whose fault it was. Maybe it was both parties' fault. Maybe the company went out of business. You know, maybe it's just some external exogenous macroeconomic event that caused things to, or the person's just a little bit picky. Maybe the person has a Humboldt degree and wants to get the best value for, for, for her uh, or his uh, investment and may decide maybe, you know, I've got three jobs here, they're all kind of okay, but they're not exactly what I wanted. One, I have to travel 100 kilometers to go to, right? So I can actually control a little bit my own destiny. And because of that, people can get really fired up about it on both sides. People can get upset about unemployment because they're working and they feel like they're getting, they're paying for somebody else's inactivity. Or you might think, uh, you know, I've been, I've been uh, denied a possibility that, uh, that is due to me because I got this education, this training, this, this degree. Okay? And we know that unemployment moves around over the times, over period, uh, over the years, and that's kind of what macroeconomics looks at. There's some short-run, high-frequency movements, like like Christmas, you know, Hanukkah. Um, I don't know. They're just. I mean, we, we know that these things. We don't always know when they happen, you know. Like, um, but we know that they happen every year, once a year, 
and you can see it in the data. Those are seasonal things that are really clearly going to happen. So in, around the summer, we see an increase in unemployment. Around the fall, we see a decrease in unemployment. Around Christmas, we see a decrease in unemployment. This is just a fact. It's, it's a seasonal effect. Okay, and then we also have the business cycle, which is much more important because it's not so predictable, right? We know that Christmas or, um, you know, any number of holidays come every, every year, and we can almost say with exactitude when they, when they come. Sometimes you can't say when bad weather happens. So if you're a ski instructor and you have bad luck and there's no snow, then you're not going to have much work. But that's something that only happens occasionally, even controlling for global climate change. Okay. And this is kind of the story that we need for understanding macro. So if we understand L, how L sort of evolves over time, then that tells us how Y evolves, GDP. GDP is a function of inputs, one of which, the most important of which is labor. Okay, so that's kind of why this is, a, is an important course. And a lot of people in macro are now using these kind of models to sort of put into... Um, as a module into a, into a large-scale macro um, econometric or economic model. So the questions that we're going to try to answer today, you know, what's unemployment? Um, um, and is this unemployment really unrealized potential? Okay. So here's unemployment over time since 1960. This is kind of an update of, of of something in my textbook, okay? So you can see that you've got um, clearly waves and then you've got a trend. The trend is, um, in the case of Switzerland, pretty, pretty obvious. It's been going up, uh, but from a very low level. And um, the same could almost be said of Europe. If you think of Europe in the 1960s, it was a really time, interesting time of high growth and increasing prosperity and uh, unemployment is very low. Um, Germany was importing workers from southern Europe or from Turkey. Uh, and then you have the United States, which looks more like a, a very cyclical and yet asymmetric, um, asymmetrically cyclical um, wave. Okay? It's, it's, it's striking that even the amplitude of the wave is, um, is pretty much bounded, and, it, and it's, uh, there are a few infrequent, really severe recessions. And... Um, if I extended this through the pandemic, you'd see the same thing. I'll show you a picture in a second. Unemployment also has a spatial dimension. So we have people in space that are unemployed. And sometimes the unemployment rate is quite different. So this is an old uh, map, but it's very, very interesting. So this is um, the, the German um, labor market uh, administrative districts. So the... Um, the um, the Arbeitsagentur has have have administrative units, and then each one of these has kind of an unemployment rate, and you can they measure it very very effectively, as you can see. Uh, and the white um, Kreise, um, Arbeitsamtsbezirke, whatever they call them nowadays, um, are, are kind of light. So you see Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg is, and this is a general story. So if you want to get a job with probability one, you know, get a good training and move to Bavaria. And of course, you may have to find a very expensive apartment, but that's one reason why these unemployment rates aren't converging. But indeed, unemployment is just persistently lower in southern Germany. It's fascinating. Okay, and in northern Germany, eh, not so much. Depends on whether you're in the east or the west. And if you're in the west, it's been lower than in the east. And that has to do with unification. Note that east Germany is mostly an completely east. There's no southern Germany. So that makes it very nice to talk about. You don't have to talk about east and west. But there is an east and west dimension. But the interesting thing is in the recent years, the unemployment rate in the east is actually starting to fall below levels in the west, right? Despite all the, the complaining people uh, tend to do about, about the, uh, the lack of um, really increasing in prosperity in east Germany. You can see that in, in Thuringia, we now have seven, in, in 2013, the, the situation is even much better than it is in this, in this picture compared to uh, North Rhine-Westphalia on the left. So you already see sort of a, a convergence. 
But if you'd gone back 10 years before this, you would have seen unemployment in Mecklenburg, Vorpommern, uh, Western uh, Pomerania, <laughs> um, uh, in excess of 20%. All right, so you have this spatial, so you're asking, why do these people in northern and eastern Germany, why don't they just go down to Bavaria and hang out there and get a job? Okay, well, that tells us maybe it's not that trivial. Maybe there are frictions preventing this type of arbitrage from happening. That's really what the course is about, trying to understand that. Okay, so I tried to update it for you a little bit. You can see things have gotten much better in the past few years. We have this trend of falling unemployment. Unemployment in Germany is now very, very low compared to the past 25, 30 years, even in the East. Okay. So there are three ways of thinking about this. There are three ways of thinking about this. One um, I'll call the neoclassical perspective, which is basically um, should always be your benchmark. You learned it when you, you took your first economics course. It's, it's all in Marshall. Upward sloping supply, downward sloping demand. Supply, sometimes labor supply is a little bit different, but in general we can assume that it's an upward sloping curve as an aggregate proposition. So the neoclassical perspective is basically a way of, of pinning, down, pinning down the arguments. It's not necessarily the last, the end uh, of the story, but it's important. And it drives from simple microeconomic analysis. So you've got, a, you've got a, a labor supply curve that comes from people's choice. And the fiction that we deal with here is there's a representative agent. The representative agent chooses between um, basically two things. One is labor um, that's not rendered in the in the labor supply in the, the labor market, which would be leisure. So if you stay home all day and watch TV or uh, go out and party, dance, whatever you do, um, you get some utility from that. But if you don't do that, you're not going to be able to work. And if you don't work, you're not going to have money. And you don't have money, you can't consume. Okay, so we have indifference curves that to, to sort of describe our, our feelings about uh, these two things. They're both positive. They both enter our utility positively. And the more we get, uh, the happier we are. Of course, you can't have more leisure than 24 hours in the day. And part of that is sleeping. So maybe there's an upper, upper bound on, the, on the, 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 the leisure possibility set combined with consumption. But consumption is generally concerned, considered to be better if you, um, if you get more of it, so we have this local non-satiability, and therefore the indifference curves that are above and to the right tend to be, um, will be associated with, with higher levels of, of utility. So, and under this very simple and simplistic analysis, which is extremely powerful, um, we are faced with a budget constraint, and the budget constraint is the, and what is the, what is the budget constraint determined by? Yes, that, the number of hours available, that's going to be, I'm, I'll call that L, script L bar, okay, but what, what's, the, what's determining the slope of that, of that budget line? What's the rate of trade-off in the market for le leisure for consumption? Wage? Yeah, it's the real wage because the consumption uh, on the vertical is, is a real uh, object. And the wage, if you just take the wage out of the newspaper or the wage at your current job, it's a, usually in, in euros, so you have to somehow correct for that. So you want to divide the, the wage by the, the price of consumption goods in terms of euros, right? So it's a real, I, I didn't put that there just on purpose, just so, to make you think, because this is kind of the, but again, this is just, this is the model we're going to be con, con, complaining about, because it doesn't capture all the interesting aspects. Okay, but in the, in the background, people are making this choice, right? Labor leisure choice. And if you add up all the people's individual decisions and consider that if you're taking leisure, then you're not working, so labor supply is the complement to, to leisure, then you have a, an upward sloping uh, labor supply as long as people have normal preferences over leisure and consumption. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna assume that, or we have assumed that in the past. Usually, um, it's, this is in this. If you take my advanced labor market course, labor economics course, we'll we'll go into detail about that assumption. But this is kind of a 
And the more individual labor supply curves you put together, you end up aggregating to something that's flatter because there are a lot of people out there who can toss their labor supply into the mix. This model is extremely powerful. It already explains quite a bit. It explains, for example, why people in Europe work less than the United States because the net return to work, private return to work, is higher in the United States. And it's higher not just in the United States, it's higher in Canada, it's higher in, the, in Switzerland. And why would you suppose that to be a, where would that come from? What's a common characteristic in Japan actually also? What could be systematic about those countries that would affect labor supply? Real wages, okay, they might be higher, but they also, even if productivity of workers is the same, they might be higher, the real wage might be higher in the United States because taxes are lower. Because it's the net real wage that matters, not the gross real wage. Remember that, okay? But, you know, there's again, think about what this is. This is basically hours per capita of working age. So it's basically, you're looking at all the people who, have, who could be working, and you know they're not all going to be working you know, 80 hours a week. Some people will be doing something else. They'll be retired. They might be in education like you guys. Okay, So that's going to reduce a little bit the, the amount of hours per person. Um, but you can see basically there's, uh, there are huge differences. And they're due to several things. They're, they're due to the number of hours per person of, of working age being decomposed into the hours per person who actually are working, we call that the intensive margin, times the number of people who are actually um, working in the pool of people who could be working. So we talk about an extensive margin, that's the latter, and the intensive margin is the former. So both of those could move and contribute to that last table that I showed you, right? Again, this is, this is by way of introduction. Again, we're gonna be talking about zero, one, decisions, but this is part of labor economics as well. It's the first cut, the first perspective of, of, the, labor, um, of the labor market. Now firms hire people. Firms and governments, in some countries the government is very, very active and important. And we tend to think that governments and especially firms care about what the workers do. They don't just hire them for fun. It's got to be part of some plan to make money for the owners of the firm, right? We say profit maxim maximization is, is behind this. So the firm has a production function, that's the upper pink uh, curve, it's got concave sort of shape, and the more labor it puts into the production process, the more output is produced, right? So it's a, you've all seen this before. So the idea is the, uh, the firm will choose its labor input basically when it knows how much labor costs it. And uh, the more productive workers are relative to the wage, the more likely firms are to produce, and uh, firms are to, are to hire and produce with those, with those workers. So if you think about it, that, that slope of the, of the curve is kind of important. And if we're not using much labor, that curve is pretty steep. The marginal productivity of workers is high, and if we're using a lot of workers, the productivity will be less. So that's kind of a simple input to neoclassical economics, and that's really important because it says that the marginal productivity of labor is a declining function of the inputs, and therefore, if the workers are being hired on the basis of whether the firm can increase profits or not, the firms will hire workers whenever the marginal product of labor is higher than the wage. So given, given the this this line R, uh, you can see comparing that with the slope of the curve, that this, at this point A, firms are doing the best they can given that wage, and if you change the wage, you change the slope of this, this ray with, with, with end point R, and that would change the labor demand. And the higher the wage is, the less firms will hire. So that gives us a labor demand curve that's negatively sloped. Again, neoclassical economics 101. And we know from from our other courses that when, it, when labor demand um, is changing, it's usually due to either a change in the cost of labor or it's the, the productivity of labor. So if, if the productivity of labor increases 
exogenously, we would think of that as a shift outward of this, this uh, production function, and that would cause the marginal product usually to shift to the right. Okay, but it really it requires us to look very carefully at, at the curve holding labor constant before and after, because you're asking whether this curve's slope is increasing or decreasing. And the way you learned it probably in microeconomics was it usually increases, but it doesn't have to. This is the case of where it does. So workers are more productive, the demand for labor at any wage increases. Right, this is again, no math, just thinking hard about it. Okay, so an equilibrium in this, mar in this neoclassical perspective is really easy. The wage clears the market. At the wage, there's no excess demand and there's no excess supply for labor, or of labor. Okay, so we can, again, that's a really simple, but, and it's gonna be the basis of the critique that I'm gonna put out um, of neoclassical economics. You cannot do better than point A because any other point on that, in that quadrant corresponds to excess supply of labor or excess demand for labor. And that would imply that we can improve things by changing the wage, changing the amount of people that are working, and point A is kind of a maximizing the surplus um, of the demanders of labor and the suppliers of labor. Right, so it's just kind of what you learned throughout your history in, in this wonderful subject that we have, right? Okay, so if, if demand shifts, you know, workers become more productive at any given level of, of, of activity, this would cause firms to increase their demand for labor and that would cause the wage to rise. It's an extremely well-validated fact um, in, all, in, in extremely general circumstances, but there are, always, there are always questions we can ask, well, does the, wage, does the wage adjust properly? But if the wage does adjust, if we compare um, the right to, you know, situations in a, in a natural experiment, we tend to get something like a positive correlation of, of the wage with employment when demand is shifting. Okay, but it doesn't have to be like that. You could have supply shifting. So you could have the, the Mariel boat lift when 150,000 Cubans went to Miami exogenously. That would be like a supply shift. Everything else unchanged, you know, would have a different prediction for the wage. The neoclassical framework would predict that wages fall. And at the same time, uh, there's an increase in, um, in employment that we observe. Because we observe the dot, right? Okay, so that's, that's the, 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 one of the perspectives that we will, be, will not be dealing with in this course, right? The, the point of this course is to deal with, um, with reasons that unemployment might emerge. And one, one of the first approaches to, to try to explain unemployment uh, in, the, uh, in the various crises that followed the, um, the boom times of the, uh, the late 19th century, we're basically trying to ask, well, maybe the wage doesn't really adjust properly. Right, so maybe there's something, there's some, some rigidity, some stickiness. Um, Pigou said it was because of uh, maybe labor unions or institutional factors. Maybe it's the minimum wage having some effect. Okay, what does that, what does that imply? That implies that there's some, there's some level of the real wage that is just this red, exogenously fixed level. And if you look carefully at that, you see immediately we have labor supply exceeds labor demand. Firms would love to hire more workers at a lower wage, but they won't. And workers would love to work at this high wage, but they can't find any work. So it's really easy. You know, this is an easy, um, I think even, even people before Pigou were talking about um, wage rigidity as a source of unemployment in, in industrial Britain, for example. Certainly it might explain the business cycle because in boom times, the wages are kind of rigid, and, and then you can imagine workers working too much, basically. They would like, and they make, might start going on strike. Um, in a competitive market, they can't go on strike. It doesn't help, because they can't change the wage. So this is, um, this is a great start to a, explaining unemployment, okay? You can also imagine wages being too low, like I just said, and then you would have excess demand for labor, and because wages don't rise, you have a lot of people uh, looking um, 
uh, for workers, but very few people who want to work at those lower wages. Okay. Now that that approach has also had some uh, some success, some traction. It may explain uh, why um, the German labor market did so phenomenally well up up until the pandemic. Unemployment was very very low. It's, it's probably the lowest it's been since the 1970s. Uh, and workers uh, were taking their time. Uh, you know, there was a there was a bit of rumbling about wages being too low, and the firms complaining about not being able to find workers. It's a classic sort of situation. It doesn't really make sense though, because in these models, information is complete. So there's no reason that workers can't um, be found. You can find them; they just don't want to work. That's the this neoclassical approach. So maybe maybe those two those two um, approaches are not very uh, consistent because they don't really explain unemployment very well. Or maybe the second one almost does, but we'll see in a second that it may not. Um, we do have these different interpretations of unemployment. Right? So what is unemployment? Right? And is it, is it really unemployment that's volu involuntary or is it voluntary? That's what I alluded to at the beginning. This is a, one of the classic questions of our field. Okay, and so if you look at, if you look at these, um, the two competing explanations I just gave you, Right, you can see that um, in a Marshall, a Marshallian type of setup in the left-hand side, the, the labor market clears. With the same labor demand and supply curves at a higher wage, we have this excess supply of labor. And it may not be much. Maybe the labor supply is vertical. In any particular market, it might be not so uh, elastic. But you're still, you're still going to have some labor supply response that's evoked um, brought about because of the higher wage, and then you've got clearly restricted demand for labor. Okay, you can imagine if, if labor supply um, shifts in these two conditions, um, well, one, you get, you get a positive reaction in employment, and the other one, you don't get anything. If the wage doesn't come down and more workers come to the market, you're just going to have an increase in unemployment. On the other hand, if you can reduce the wage, this would increase employment, right, because the, the buy, the, the, the binding uh, constraint in this market on the right-hand side is the labor demand curve. So that was creating some, unco some, some um, uncomfortable academics and also analyses that were basically uh, relying, basing the whole, evident, the whole uh, argument on firms um, basically not being willing to hire workers. Maybe there are firms that are willing to hire workers. They just can't find them. Okay. So that, that curve, um, I mean, that, that diagram kind of gives you the idea that unemployment that we observe is either voluntary, like this, or it's involuntary because wages aren't coming down. So it's a pretty, pretty narrow view of, uh, of the world. Now, at the same time, we have reality, which the, um, our governments have defined for us. Uh, you need a practical definition. We can all debate whether people are voluntarily, involuntarily employed, but um, we, need to f we need to produce some numbers for the government. So how would you produce the government? What, how would you produce the numbers? It's a really tricky question. How does Germany generate its unemployment rate? How does it produce an unemployment statistic? Anybody? Many of you are not from Germany, so where are you from? Where are you guys from? Okay. 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 So, the incredible diversity. Very, very interesting. Um, any clue how you guys do it? I think if you're registered as unemployed, so if you're looking for a job, then you can't find one. Okay. So, that's a, that's a great answer. So, you're registered with some government agency, maybe an employment agency, maybe there isn't an employment agency. Uh, there's an alternative to that strategy. That's also the way the Germans did it for a long time, but now they're sort of going back and forth. The other, the alternative is to ask the the people, ask them, what did you do last week? Did you have a job? Were you working? If you weren't working, were you looking? If you're not looking, what were you doing? <laughs> and a lot of people 
aren't looking because they're discouraged or they're in school or they're retired or they're too young to be working. Maybe they're handicapped. They have some other disadvantage, okay? Or maybe they're just not looking. Maybe they're just taking it easy. Maybe they just lost their job and they're waiting for something to come back. So lots of different. So the ILO basically, the International Labor Organization has decided we just ask a question. We go into a survey mode and ask about, you know, several thousand people, sometimes like in the United States, you know, 100,000 people every, uh, every month. It's a big deal. It's a huge, costly operation. That's the only way you can actually do it right. So I think Egypt probably does it maybe once a year, does a survey of people, because a lot of people are in the informal economy, and they would never have any contact. You know, if you're selling bread on the street, it's a different activity than working in a factory where the government's paying Social Security contributions to the, to the government. So this is the question the ILO poses when they do their, their thing, okay? So where's the unemployment? Right, that's the person who basically says, I was not working, I'm able to work, and I'm looking. I've undertaken concrete measures in the measurement period, which might be the last month, sometimes the last week or two weeks. Um, I can, that can't be the case of, in this particular um, setup, unless you thought that people were randomly sort of applying uh, and just getting turned down. But this, this, this model basically says that people know the wage is too high and um, they're willing to work at that wage, but they just can't find anything. But not finding anything means that there there's, won't be any demand forthcoming because the firm's demand is already determined. Come on in. Yeah, so Keynes, John Maynard Keynes said, well, maybe the, the secret is just to say that people are, would like to work at that wage, but they can't find work. Okay, but not being able to find work means that something's preventing this wage from coming down. And that just seems like such a, a deus ex machina, sort of an arbitrary assumption to make things work. Because if people argued, well, maybe the workers could cut a special deal with the firm, say, look, you're paying these guys too much, I'm willing to work for less. And for some reason, maybe it's social solidarity or some reason that we don't understand from economics because we're too, too narrowly focused on utility maximization, we just don't get it, um, this wage doesn't come down. So you have to be appealing to things like wage rigidity. It has to be something to do with unions or management, only being willing to speak to unions, not allowing workers to undercut and, and cause the labor market to find equilibrium again. So a lot of people blame minimum wages. That's an easy one, right? Yeah. Good question. Um, we're kind of talking about the, the wage in the labor market, um, but it's there are many wages. Quite, quite different from other markets in the sense that there isn't like a price for labor that everybody can look at. Right, like exactly. Kind of, uh, figuring out their personal wage, what they're employing. Sure. Yeah, that's part of, that's part of the, the, the secret of search and matching is that, that this productivity is not commonly observable information and maybe persons have a different judgment about their own productivity or maybe firms can't learn about the productivity until they hire somebody. These are all things we'll talk about in the course, okay? So that's part of it, but we can define the labor market in a very, very narrow way. We can talk about the, the market for nurses with medium qualifications and, you know, that we can, we can narrow it down and we can still get this unemployment because it's systematic. A lot of people um, in uh, high unemployment situations are coming from industries where normally they, people would have a job. So that, well, it's, it's uh, again, maybe the abstraction of a single wage is too much because maybe all the wages don't move in the same way. So that would be the, 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 the initial reaction would be, sure, there's a representative wage. And if you raise that representative wage, all wages will rise together because that, otherwise it wouldn't be representative. Okay, so that's a, that's a way of getting around that argument. And then there's, there's the, um, the notion that maybe there's a, a minimum wage out there. So this W min would be the high wage. It would create lots of unemployment and then workers, um, have a union and they're bargaining um, or they're setting the wage somehow that would cause us to be at point B. So these are like different ways of trying to save neoclassical economics and um, 
with some rigidity. Okay. So the question is, are these really satisfactory? So I, I think you know there are lots of reasons to to wonder if if uh, we've done enough, and and the, the profession has moved uh, very far in another direction, which is that maybe we need another perspective. We need to think about this this fact that unemployment is not always voluntary, but it's also not always involuntary. Okay, there's some sort of mix. Okay, and if you look at the United States, you probably get a good, a good idea of why that's the case. You have huge fluctuations in unemployment. And um, it's hard to imagine this is due to sudden changes in taste that people just feel not like stopping working for a while. Uh, that these are vacation times. You also, it's hard to believe that the firms uh, have just made huge mistakes. Um, maybe there's something driving the business cycle that, that produces unemployment as a byproduct. But this last spike is the pandemic. And what, to me, it's so remarkable, just looking at these data, I got these a couple of days ago, you can see that the, the pandemic resulted in the highest unemployment rate on paper in a month, this is monthly data, um, since the 1950s, but it didn't last very long. So it's kind of like a natural experiment. As soon as the, as soon as the, 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 the worst waves passed and, and uh, Trump told us everything was fine, or he didn't, then he didn't get reelected. Um, things kind of went back to normal again. But the pandemic hasn't disappeared yet. Okay, it's, it's still out there. Unemployment is just very, very low in the United States right now. Okay, so that kind of gives us a feel, a feel for that. If you break this down by, by race in the United States, this is an enormous, enormously interesting uh, fact. So it's well known that African Americans in the United States have a persistently higher unemployment rate. And I would be the first to say this is due to systemic discrimination, but you could also adduce another, a whole range of, of other explanations. The fact is, it's just higher, okay? And it could have to do with demographics, it could do all, so, all sorts of things. And if you look very, very closely, you see that the Hispanic or Latinx population is somewhere in between. Very interesting. Now, the United States is a, kind of a strange country in that they ask this in the survey. So the, <laughs> the survey taker is asking a person of their ethnic uh, identity. Um, you know, you'd think that's kind of politically uh, inappropriate these days, but actually it does help us direct programs towards people who may be disadvantaged. So I, that's why I have no problem with it. If you look at the Asian population, it's below the average, or actually below the average and below the Caucasian population. Okay, so you can see there might be some discrimination involved. There might be some um, things that we don't understand. I'm not going to comment on that in this course, but it's really fascinating. The point I'm trying to make is these are different rates. We need to understand why they're different. And this approach that I'm going to talk about today actually helps us in that respect. But it's a different approach um, from the classic Marshallian or Puguvian type of uh, labor approach, labor market approach. Another insight is looking at the people who in the United States or in other countries that have been unemployed for a long time. It's the fact that duration can differ uh, means that people are not the same. Some people are stuck for a long time in unemployment and some people go through very quickly. Again, this is the kind of thing that makes labor economists extremely excited. Most people would fall asleep. <laughs> but we get ex we get it excited about that. Yeah. Do you know this is more post uh, financial crisis? Yeah, I'm going to show you. This is just to get you get you interested and in get someone like you to ask the question. So this is measured as a fraction of the total labor force of all people in the United States that that are um, in the labor force and have been unemployed for more than 26 weeks. That's the standard because the, the survey question asks how long have you been unemployed and they don't keep coming to the same person. They actually rotate them through. So you need to ask this question all the time uh, and, and also check for consistency because people forget what they did last month and the month before. Sometimes they change their, they're not really well attached to the labor force. But this big jump is the financial crisis, not the pandemic. So I updated this. this is, I, I stole this from The Economist. Um, this is the, the updated per yesterday. Okay, so this is, this is a slightly different measure. This is the fraction of all unemployed in the U.S that had been unemployed for more than 26 weeks, 27 weeks or more. Okay, so you see the same pattern. 
except you see that the US recovered from the great financial crisis, and long-term unemployment actually fell uh, quite a bit. And it fell actually to 20% before the pandemic, and then it, it dropped very, very sharply. And that's because the total number of unemployed people rose very sharply. Right, so this is the fraction of people who are long-term unemployed. And then as people became more, as people went back to work, the, the, uh, the ratio jumped again, and then it continued to fall. So the, this last, the last year of the United States has been a really like a boom town uh, for, from, from the labor supplier's perspective. Unemployment has fallen extremely sharply back to the, to the previous, the pre-pandemic um, end of the Trump administration period. Is anyone from the United States here? Okay, just checking. So this is another way of thinking about it. Why are there different people, why are there long-term unemployed people? In that Marshallian picture, you don't get any sort of long-term unemployment. So you, you, you can't talk about long-term unemployment with the traditional labor supply and labor demand. I mean, why would you discriminate against older people or people who have been unemployed a long time? If you do, then it's not in the model. We don't have different labor markets for different durations of unemployment. You could do that, but it's kind of, uh, it's like splitting hairs, right? So it's, uh, and often you don't know how long the person's been unemployed when you interview them. <laughs> so you need to find out. Sometimes they don't want to tell you. Okay, so let's think about, let's, let's, let's throw everything in the wastebasket for a while and think about something else. All right, let's think about frictions. Things that prevent a labor market from reaching the crosshairs of the Marshallian system. Okay, so this is going to focus on the discrete nature of being in the labor market. So when you leave this place and you start looking for a job, you will be probably no longer out of the labor force, you will be in the labor force because you'll be looking for a job. And maybe you'll get a job immediately and then you will be employed. Maybe you won't and you'll be unemployed. And you might be unemployed for some time. We talk about transitions. These are discrete transitions between labor market states. So that's the, the, the buzzword is states. Okay? And because labor, market, labor supply is not only a continuous decision, like do I work 15 hours today or I work 17 hours? Most people don't do that. Most of the variation comes from the discrete yes, no, working, not working. Right, so that's kind of logical, I said that already. So we can actually write down a, a picture. We can write down, think of just no math, just think of moving between unemployed and employed to get a job. If I get laid off, unemployed, or if I quit, to another job, I might sort of make a loop, change the identity of my employer. Maybe I'll spend some time in unemployment because I get a few months of unemployment benefits. Maybe my employer says, I'll, I'll lay you off and we'll go out and have a beer sometime. You know, and you pay for the beer <laughs> with your unemployment benefits. I hope that doesn't happen too often, but if it does, no one's gonna know. But in any case, passing through unemployment is like a state transition. So, if you think about unemployment as a state, then every engineer will say, well, how many people came into unemployment during a period and how many people left unemployment? That's the logical way of thinking about a state, inflows and outflows. And that's the central aspect of labor markets with search and matching frictions. You have transitions and then you have reasons that these transitions can't be undone or that they, that they occur at all is because of the, the frictional nature so if you were um, looking for a job, you're in this state and you can't find a job immediately for some reason, or maybe you've decided not to find a job, all these aspects are kind of affecting the flow. So think of a bathtub. Has anyone seen this bathtub before? This comes from my, yeah, so you took my class. <laughs> I drew this like many, many years ago and I haven't changed it. I mean, it's not because it's good, but I just don't feel like getting a copyright protected picture of a bathtub and getting sued by somebody. I just draw my own. So this, I'm not, this does not look like a bathtub. But you can see it gives you the, the blue is the water, and then you've got some inflow and you've got some outflow. So when the level of the water in the bathtub is stable, the inflows and outflows have to be equal. That's just a fact. It's an engineering fact. Okay? 
And those inflows and outflows depend on stuff. And if you want to have a closed system, you're going to have to decide how does the inflow get affected by the outflow? Or in some sense, under what conditions will the inflow, whatever determines it, be the same as the outflow, whatever determines it? Okay, so that's going to be, our, that's going to be the, the end of the story for today, is understanding those two inflows and how describing an equilibrium or a steady state of that system would be inflows equal outflows. It's real simple. So this is an easy, easy lecture. Next week it gets more complicated. Okay? So I'm going to derive this formula for you. I'll give you the formula first and then I'll derive it. Basically it says that the unemployment rate when, and this is the rate, it's also true of the stock, if the labor force in total is unchanged, this unemployment rate will be the quotient of the inflow rate as a fraction of the employed divided by S plus F, where F is the outflow rate as a fraction of the unemployed. Okay? And and Thomas, who is actually here today, and I didn't introduce him, but if you turn around and look in, in that corner, you'll see Thomas Dengler. He is the section leader. He will be teaching the, uh, the tutorial for this course, and he will go through that um, this week. Tell us when it is again. I forgot. It, um, when, the, when the day is. Yeah. It's Friday at 30 in the room next to this one. So unfortunately, it's very early. We couldn't do better than that, but... Um, and you can get all the details on Moodle. I think most of you hit the Moodle page already, okay? Okay, so I'm going to come back to that, derive that model in a second, but I, want to, I just want to show you that this is important. Before we explain where the, that, that, that equation comes from, let's go back and think about this. Um, stocks and the flows are huge. So this is not a joke. This is serious. Um, the, the, the water that's passing in and out of this bathtub per year is enormous. Even per month, it's enormous. So this perspective is a serious perspective on labor markets. This is in, taken in 2006. It's a while back, but things have not changed. In fact, if anything, they've gotten higher. So in Austria, as a country, a fairly small country, um, 240,000 people were unemployed on average during the entire year. And during... During that year, over the course of that year, 920,000 inflow cases occurred. Now, some of those people might have had multiple trips. They might have been unemployed several times. They came in and came out of the bathtub. Okay, but fact is, the Austrian Employment Agency reports 920,000 new cases of unemployment during the year 2006, and 1.07 million outflows, people leaving unemployed, registered unemployment. So this is the registry data. That usually requires you to go to the office and fill out some forms and meet with somebody. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's serious. I mean, they actually wrote this down. So that's a huge, that's a multiple of the stock of 240,000, right? So the, if you just add up all the water coming in, it's much bigger than the level of the water on average over the entire period. Wow. It's not just Austria. Germany is just as bathtubby <laughs> as it were. So I, I, I didn't change this because it's, it's really an interesting year. This is a bad year for Germany. Germany had a high unemployment rate, unified Germany. They had just reformed the unemployment benefit system to make a lot of people who were kind of out of the labor force, they suddenly became part of the labor force. It was called the Hartz Reforms. So about four and a half million people were unemployed in this much larger country. It's a larger country. And during that same year, 7.4 million cases of unemployment were terminated, so exits, and 6.9 million new cases. So that's quite a bit of turbulence, a lot of inflows and outflows. United Kingdom, no different, a little bit less because 2006 was a good year for the UK, so they have a and again, this is not the unemployment rate, this is the stock. So to get the stock, we'd have to divide by the labor force. We'd have to go out and get it. Okay, but I'm doing this on purpose just to show you that the, the magnitudes are, can be enormous. And the United States, is a, 2006 was also a pretty decent year. Seven 
million people unemployed in the whole country on average, 31 million new cases of unemployment and 32 million uh, exits from unemployed using the, the US methodology, which is the survey, the CPS survey method. So unemployment fell in the United States during that year. Anytime the, the outflows are greater than the inflows, unemployment should be falling, right? Okay, it turns out this, this flow is also interesting from a spatial perspective. So this is, um, this is the United Kingdom um, in a, a long time ago, but these, these data are quite interesting in that particular year. If you look carefully at it, you see that, and this is the inflow rate as a fraction of uh, all employed, you can see that it varies quite a bit across, across countries, across uh, regions. So we have the, the London region, well known to be a, a pretty low unemployed employment place, but it turns out there are other regions that have even lower unemployment. And then you have the northern um, regions that, that were highly industrialized, uh, Scotland also, they have some structural issues. Um, those inflow rates are higher. So people are losing jobs more frequently. Um, and the unemployment rate is actually quite strongly correlated with that. So in the, in, the, in the low unemployment regions in the UK, they tend to have low inflow rates. So with a bathtub isn't getting flooded very quickly, um, unemployment tends to be lower. So that's gonna suggest that this formula I gave you before is actually pretty, pretty accurate. In fact, it's almost tautological, but holding the outflow rate constant it would suggest that increases in the inflow rate are positively correlated with the unemployment rate. Okay, so that's a nice fact for you to interpret these, these numbers. Okay, now some of you might be asking, okay, did we miss something? What about people who are out of the labor force? Do we, should we take care of them? Well, yes, of course, you should, you should take care of them, but the flows in and out of the labor force are small relative to the flows between unemployment and unemployment on a month-to-month -month basis. So we will kind of ignore them, but you can, you can incorporate them. And later on in the course, we'll probably have a few examples of where you can actually adapt the model, models that we use to, to think about the participation decision. Remember, this is the, this not in the labor force is the group of people in the universe of people of working age who have decided not to work and not to look for work. Okay. So let's go back and derive, let's derive this, um, this formula. Okay. So I'm gonna try to do this on the screen. So we can think of, we can think of the change in unemployment as the difference between inflows and outflows. This is true for any delta stands for change. That's easy. And this is the absolute number of people, not the rate. Now, if we take the view that being in the labor force is is basically an exhaustive state, so you can either be unemployed or employed, but we're not gonna consider people leaving the labor force or entering the labor force. So it's a, maybe a stagnant demography to start with. Again, believe me, um, on a quarter to quarter basis, the, the, the big flows are between jobs and unemployment. We can think of the labor force as L bar and just equals L employment plus U. And U is what, what we're changing when we put that delta in front of it. Okay, so the, right? So that's, the, that's a key assumption to make things really easy to solve. Because otherwise, if you have a third state, then you have to worry about those transitions. And like I said, the rate of retirement in Germany or in the United States is, is rather small. People aren't retiring like crazy, and people aren't leaving to go to school at a high rate. That would be another reason you'd leave the labor force. If you went, you left your job to get a an upgrade, you know, some continuing education program that lasted for a year, so you literally weren't working for the, the firm, didn't have you on the payroll anymore, you actually left the firm or something like that. Okay, so what, the next step is basically to say that the inflows, and this is, again, this is just a descriptive, um, 
a descriptive term, a descriptive tool. And now I'm running to my classic uh, technical issues here. Inflows. We're going to say, or just basically, a rate of separation from the job times the number of people working in the job. So at some deep level, this could actually be a model in itself, but it's really just a description. And I will try to tell you where S comes from in the course of this, of this course. <laughs> and, um, but this is going to be enough to get us somewhere to help us get this formula, because I want to derive this formula. Outflows, we're going to define as an outflow rate out of unemployment. And what's the obvious stock to think about for, the, for unemployment? The unemployment stock. So F times U. And these are, again, little s and little f are like rates, and big L and big U are stocks. So what do I need to do now? I need to define an equilibrium concept. Stationary state or when unemployment stops changing. Right, so that would, we already have that here. So delta U equals S times L minus F times U. And I want that to be zero. OK. Now, everybody agree with that? I can divide, divide that by L bar, which is, the, which, is, which is what? What is L bar? The labor force. Right, the labor force, the total population, because you can't be out of the labor force in this setup, because I've, I've told you that you can't. But if you want to, you can. You can put it in. It doesn't, help, it doesn't change the logic. OK, so let's, um, let's divide by that. Let's divide everything by L bar. I can do that. So what's my next step? Well, this is 0. We already said that's 0, so I can get rid of that. And what is u divided by L bar? L bar is the labor force. What does the ILO define the unemployment rate as? It's unemployment divided by the labor force. So I'm going to use a small u to distinguish that from the big u. And what is this object? What is L divided by L bar? Well, you could call it that. But in this particular setup, it's 1 minus the unemployment rate, right? The, the, a lot of people Dis dispute what the, uh, the employment rate should be in terms of a definition. A lot of people call, speak of the employment ratio, which is taking employment divided by the, by the working age population. So I want to try to avoid that if I can, but you're absolutely right. You could define it as the fraction. But since we already have this other thing defined, we could just write S times 1 minus U. So now I just solve for little u. And I get exactly that formula. OK, so u equals s divided by s plus f. So wow. All I did is make a few assumptions, and I got this great result that says that if I can consider f, s and f as being sort of exogenous, I've got a system. I've got a, I've got a determinate unemployment rate. And the higher the inflow rate into the bathtub, the higher the unemployment rate. And the higher the outflow rate, the lower the unemployment rate is. So all I need is a good theory to explain S and F. And we'll spend the first few weeks of this course dealing with that. Okay? But believe me, you'll go on to do other things in your life. You won't probably be a labor economist. This is really useful. It helps me explain why in Austria, fairly prosperous Austria, 
certain regions have high unemployment rate. They have a high unemployment rate compared to places like in the city, in the business district of, of Vienna, for example. You can calculate this for, for almost any geographic um, un, unit that you can, you can find data for. Why would you think that the, the unemployment rate in the mountains where people go skiing or hiking might be higher? No, don't, don't think about leisure. Think about this model. <laughs> think about the bathtub. And the F is lower because it's harder to find it in the dark because you're so separated from... Could be. Nice, nice try, but no, I'm, I'm looking for S. <laughs> it's, a good, it's, it's, it's a consistent explanation, but I think the empirical um, variability of, of exit rates are, is lower than it is for the, finding, for the, for the separation rates. So the finding rates are across regions are less variable. And why would that be? Think about the mountains. I already told you before. No. In the weather yeah. in the winter, for example, every yeah. winter will have a big outflow. Yeah. Uh, but, it, it go to that. but it could it could be exactly the opposite reason. In the mountains, people go skiing. When it snows a lot, the ski instructors and the people who normally work in the, in the business uh, would be finding work. And during the summer, there's no snow, so they can't work. So just by construction, the inflow rates into unemployment are high because during a year, everyone becomes unemployed and they get benefits from the Austrian government. It makes sense for them to do that. Okay, It's the same as true in the south of Spain. The same is true in many parts of Europe where there's high, high touristic, um, um, high, high uh, sort of um, large tourist sector or tourism sector, um, but also other, other you know, any, any sort of cyclical activity uh, could lead to this result. That's one, so, so variability in S would explain why in England, in London, the unemployment rate is so low as opposed to an industrial region in the north where they've had a lot of problems a lot of problems with the coal industry, a lot of problems, with, and just have been shrinking over the past, especially in the, in the 2000, de yeah. But I mean, this only holds for the equilibrium assumption that the unemployment rate stays constant, mm -hmm. right? Right. And if we talk about cyclical uh, differences in employment, don't we have a changing unemployment rate? Yes, of course. So from, from one unemployment rate to another implies um, an, a disequilibrium of inflows and outflows. And unemployment rising would mean there's more inflows relative to outflows. They could even both be rising, but one is rising faster. And declining unemployment would mean more outflows. So you're exactly right, but the, the paradox is that these things track each other incredibly well. So I, one, of, one, one paper that I actually wrote in the 1990s pointed that out. Even in high unemployment Germany, those things move together. The inflows and outflows is a fraction of the labor force. And the small differential is what drives the unemployment rate up. It's just a small differential relative to this huge gushing in, inflow and outflow of people. So a lot of people have no problem finding a job after they lose their job. You know, they may even welcome losing their job. And it's the residual, the people who spend a lot of time in the bathtub is what interests us in this field. Okay, so that's a, it's a great question. Unfortunately, it's not what you think. Um, the gross flows are very large relative to the, to the net flows. So it's a great fact, great question, great fact. Okay, and that's kind of what this is pointing out. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll spend the last 15 minutes talking about the guy on the right. The guy on the right is the guy who developed the model, um, and all three of them got a Nobel Prize based on their work in this area. And the last one is Chris Pissarides, who basically put this in a very, very succinct form that we can all understand and I can put on the exam. It's about how you figure out what F and S are. Okay, so now it's going to get a little bit more formal. And the idea is simply, when you're looking for an apartment, when you're looking for a parking space, you're looking for uh, your friend at Bergheim or you're trying to find somebody you'd like to meet at Bergheim, you know, these are huge problems. It's not trivial. <laughs> it's also not easy to find a job. 
So all these things have this common feature that some friction is preventing me from finding my ideal situation. Right? That's the, that's the uh, exciting thing about this matching, search and matching approach. And the reason why we don't find a job immediately is maybe we don't have the information. Maybe potential employers don't have enough information about us. Maybe we don't have enough information about the employer. We can both be looking in the wrong place. And there are externalities. So what's an externality? You must know what an externality is. You're all masters, masters of the universe. You know, you're dancing around it a little bit. It's not exactly right, but it's cl you're saying something very close to what I want to hear. Yeah. Factors that are not priced in, or they're not reflected in the price. So when your activity in the market creates, uh, you know, effects that you don't get paid for or, or don't have to pay for. Okay, it's basically um, when your activities, and they may not even be market activities, but usually we, we restrict our, because we want to figure out some way to, change people's behavior, we use the price. I mean, if I just run around screaming uh, loudly in that, <laughs> in that mall over there, it's not a market activity, but people will be affected, right? That's also kind of an externality. But um, we're, we're generally thinking about things that we do that can be mediated by the market. And the fact is that, and this is what Diamond got the Nobel Prize for, is that when we search, when we look for a job, we're actually helping other people. We're helping people who want to hire us. If so, suddenly we all decide to spend a few more extra hours looking for a job, then we actually help the employers because that makes it easier for them to find us because we're looking. Right? So it's a two-sided uh, externality. And when, job, uh, when employers post job offers, um, the more they post, the more easy it is for us to find a job if we're looking. Okay. That's the externality. That's the externality that Peter Diamond talked about. And of course, you can, you can put expectations into the, into, the, into the mix. You can say that um, technological things matter, like internet. But in the end, it's the same idea. It's the same idea when you're out looking for a, a friend. You, know, you spend more time looking, then not only will you be more likely to find someone you're interested in, but that other person might also be more able to see you because you're making yourself visible. You know, think about you know, partnership.com or something like that. <laughs> okay? And in some sense, Milton Friedman, who wrote uh, about this many, many decades ago, also thought about this. He wasn't, search theory was just coming around, but he already talked about it. The information about having a vacancy or having a, a job uh, available, the cost of mobility might affect our willingness to to search or even accept a job if, it, if what we find is very far away. So I mean, people, everybody wants to live in Berlin now, but I tell you, in Halle, there are some great apartments, right? So you could, you could take the job here and live in Halle. It's a beautiful city. I've spent many, many hours in Halle. <laughs> but you have to get into a train and, and take a train for an hour and a half to get to Berlin. And if you want to do that every day, <laughs> it's going to cost. So that's kind of also a... You know, the job's there, but something's frictionally preventing us from taking it. So in, in, in this curve, in this course, we'll learn about this thing. This is called the beverage curve. This is just an empirical relationship between unemployment and vacancies. When the job market is good, unemployment is low, and the vacancy rate is high. But it's not always a single curve. The curve can move around. So Germany, in the, in the good old days, was, um, had a really hot labor market, but it was also subject to this availability. There were, there were downturns in Germany in the 1960s, and the vacancy rate went down. But the whole relationship seemed to, to kind of go to hell in the, in the succeeding decades. And, and even if you take the good, the good times after um, 2005, it's still, there's a negative relationship, but the whole thing has shifted out. And if you look at the United States, it looks similar, but less, less uh, shifting. Right? So it's a, these are the kind of things we want to talk about. And if you look at the Great Recession in the United States, what you were talking about, um, these, these uh, flow rates track incredibly each other quite, quite well. I mean, they really do have, uh, it gives you this, con conveys this idea that even the United States, where there was a huge increase in unemployment in the Great Recession, most of the workers found jobs that were laid off. 
they found something. It may not have been their best, their best uh, job. Okay. So that's what the U.S. beverage curve looks like if you take deviations from a trend. So it's a pretty robust thing. So this is kind of the, the we're going we're gonna to introduce this model now very quickly. In the section, uh, Tomas will go into some detail. It's based on Pizzeri's famous uh, papers in the 1980s. One is in the American Economic Review. The, the place to look is his book, and that's online. I, one chapter I put online for you. And it basically captures all the flavor of this. And it has, has a way of explaining basically one part of the formula we just derived. Okay, so in this model, I'm not going to be explaining S. I'm going to be explaining F, the outflow rate, as an aggregate phenomena. When the outflow rate goes up, the unemployment rate goes down. And what determines that outflow rate? Well, think of the bathtub. Think of, now think of it more. <laughs> it's not just you in the bathtub, but you're, there are a bunch of vacancies in the bathtub. And you're sort of, it's like Brownian motion. You're sort of bumping into each other at some well-defined rate that can be mathematically described. That's what we're going to be trying to do. We're going to be talking about matching. It's not going to involve turning down jobs. You're going to be very happy if you find a job, and you'll be so happy that you will accept all jobs. That's the first model we will consider. Everything after that involves rejection, one side or another, disappointment, blah, blah, blah. Right now we're doing the, the basic. This is the, the, this is the Ford Pontiac or the Volkswagen Kefa of, of, of search and matching. You have to understand this model if you want to get anywhere in this course. Right? It's really basic. I say that with a certain amount of irony. But it's based on one idea, is that if I find someone in the bathtub who wants to hire me, I have something special. I have a, a capital gain. My existence has been improved because you know, even if I have the option of turning it down, I'm still better off than not having anything at all. And in this model, it's basically if you have something, you're going to take it because the model is really simple. So you fix ideas and you understand. Um, this is based on Lucas's incredible insight in the 1970s when he basically said we should rethink how we think about labor markets because anytime you have a job, you have a capital asset. You have a match with someone who's willing to pay you for what you're doing, and maybe that person's not doing the right thing, but still, you're in, the, you're in this relationship, and that relationship reflects surplus. And when the job gets destroyed, you have a capital loss. And therefore, if you're in the bathtub, you're looking for a capital gain. You're looking for another match. Right? So that's the, 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 essence, the essence of the Lucas interpretation of the labor market. And Pissarides basically implements that. OK, so again, now we're going to talk like, like economists. We have a model. Everyone is the same in this model in the bathtub. And even if you're out of the bathtub, if you've got a job, you have a productivity. And that productivity is P. If you're not working, you're unemployed. But if you're not working and you're unemployed, you still get something. And that's B. It's like the value of leisure, going to the bar, watching a soccer game, um, going to the theater, you know, dealing with your, with your friends and relatives. That's the fallback position. So it's a, really, it's, a, it's a binary situation. You're either unemployed and you get B in the period, or you get P as a productivity that you have to share with the worker, with, the, with your boss who's employing you. So it's really simple. Okay, now think about this. If you work, you get a wage. And the wage has to be determined. And this is not supply and demand. So the wage is determined by bargaining. And next week we'll go into detail. Thomas will probably introduce it. And in Nash bargain, from microeconomics, you might remember, it's basically split the difference. All right? And it's not going to be 50-50. It can be 40-60 or 60-40. And that's going to be beta. Beta is the fraction of the surplus that we get from coming together that I get as a worker. 1 minus B is what the firm gets. So it exhausts the surplus. Right? So now you can see what's going on here. We got this. We meet. We want, we're in the bathtub. We're actually interested in finding somebody because we're better off. And we do. There's some surplus, and we share it. And we use a simple economic model of, of, of bargaining, axiomatic model of bargaining. 
in the five minutes that remain, I'm going to actually show you how these states are valued. And then next week, we'll, we'll, we'll derive the, or in the section, you'll go into detail on, on what we're doing now. And Thomas will probably get ahead of me. And then we'll talk about equilibrium conditions, because this is a model about equilibrium. So we'll look at situations where the unemployment rate is not changing anymore. We'll look at the situation where the outflows and inflows compensate each other exactly. The central element of this is a matching function. It's going to be like the, it's like, it's like a production function. It, it makes it possible to express how many new matches in the bathtub take place given the stock of searchers, the unemployed, and the stock of um, possible firms. Okay, so it's, it's going to look like this, M instead of F. It's like a production function, except a little M. Okay, and we're going to describe this M in, in a, using math. So we're going to say it has constant returns to scale. If I double U and, and double V, I get double the amount of flow matches in the period. So think of the matching function as like a periodic function. It's a period by period output of these stocks. So in a constant returns to scale, we can just factor out k for any positive k. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Luxembourg or, or Austria or Germany, you still get the same amount of flows per unit of, of inputs if you scale it up. Okay? And again, we, if you do that, that makes it very easy to write little u and little v because we can scale it by the labor force. Little v would be the vacancy rate as a fraction of labor force, and u would be the unemployment rate. The outflow rate can be scaled by the number of unemployed people. If you divide the matching function by the number of unemployed, you get a scaled version scaled by unemployment. So it's the fraction of outflows as a fraction of those people who are unemployed at the beginning of the period. So that's our F. We're done. I'm going to go into detail, of course, but the, then the unemployment rate is a function of V over U. What's V over U? V over U is an indicator of the tension in the labor market. It's the indication of vacancies per unemployed person. So when that's really high, it's a great labor market for workers, not so great for employers. It describes the, the current situation in Germany, right? The, the employers are always complaining, I can't find any workers, labor shortage. Workers are just saying, hi, yeah, I'm going to switch jobs tomorrow because I know I'm going to get 50 jo job offers. It's, it's really like that. I've been telling my students for the past three or four years, this is the time to get a job, OK? Um, things might change in a few days. <laughs> we have this Russian thing going on. So it's, I mean, there's a recession coming, and that's going to make it very hard for you to find a job, possibly. But we're not done yet because we've only determined one variable and two unknowns. We need to figure out how to pin down, we need to pin down the stock of vacancies given unemployed. So that's the rest of this, the rest of this very quick uh, derivation. So think of theta is just the ratio of V, vacancy stock, to U, or if you like, little V divided by little U, because you can scale it by whatever you want, as long as you scale it by the same thing. It's a sufficient statistic for labor market tightness in this model. The higher theta is, the harder it is for workers, for firms to find workers, and the easier it is for um, workers to find jobs. Therefore, we can speak of the vacancy filling rate as a function of the number of vacancies divided into the number of matches. OK? So just as we have little f, is a function, and Thomas will go into detail, returns to scale, derivation. You can also write Q as a function of theta. So think of Q as the firm's perspective. Think of F as the worker's perspective of getting a job. The probability of getting a job in every period. It's, it, you can, if you know something about math and statistics, it's a little bit like a Poisson intensity parameter. And that's exactly what we'll do later on in this course. So theta goes up, yay, yay for me my probability of getting a job is going up. And if I'm a worker, if I'm a firm, theta goes up, 
uh uh-uh, it's going to be hard to find, I'm going to spend a lot of time with a vacancy that no one wants to work. And if I don't have a worker in my vacancy, I can't produce. I can't produce P. Okay? So this is a fun fact that's always on the final. Okay? So because of the constant returns to scale, I can write F as a, as a function of theta either directly or I can write it as an implicit function of theta using Q. And as long as I'm assuming constant returns to scale, this will hold. So a lot of times I'll, I'll sort of sneak in a, a substitution. F is equal to theta times Q under constant returns to scale. Okay. Important fact. Fun fact. So now I'm going to derive, I'm going to just write down the last few minutes. I'm just going to show you the valuation of the state. I've got enough now to go. I've got basic, all I have to do is determine the wage. I'm, I'm ready, to, ready to roll. But I'm going to assume, just to make my life easier, that firms and workers are risk neutral because we're facing this risk all the time in the bathtub. You know, how long will it take me to get a job? You know, basically, the assumption that pissarita has got the Nobel Prize for is just saying we don't need to think about that. We're just going to think about workers and firms being risk neutral so they care about expected values of outcomes. And if you'd like to challenge that, write your master's thesis about it. It'll be a nice master's thesis, but it won't be anything new because it's already been done. Okay, so a lot of people say, eh, what about risk aversion? Sure, you can put it in. It doesn't change the underlying uh, result. But it does make things a little bit more difficult because then people want to save, and try to uh, hedge, et cetera, and it gets a little bit tricky. And to answer your question, markets are reacting fast enough that we don't have to worry about the adjustment. Pissarides worries about it in his book, but we don't have to do that. So I always tell students who complain, you know, it must be a good model because we're still using it after, after 10, 15 years. So this is, these are the sets of equations you're going to look at. Lucas, I, Lucas says that every, every worker with a job has an asset, and every unemployed person also has an asset. It's just not worth as much. Everybody wants to get a job. Because having a job is better than not having a job. And the same thing for firms. Firms would like to have a worker working in their firm. And because we have constant returns to scale, firms are indifferent. I mean, firm, one man, one firm is the, is the way this thing works. So just to make it really easy, a firm posts a vacancy. If it gets lucky and finds a worker, then the vacancy is filled and you can produce P. Otherwise, you keep on looking. So one man, one firm. One woman, one firm. Okay, so here, are the, the, what, what are these formulas? They say the value of having a job is what? You get the wage, and the wage is paid at the end of the period. So you discount it by 1 plus r. Okay? And then there's a probability you may lose your job. And if you lose it, you don't have the job anymore. So you don't have w, you get something else. We're going to call that U prime. It's the value of unemployment in this new, brave new world of being unemployed. If you persist and keep your job, you get W. But you get W prime because in that period of time, maybe things are different. In equilibrium, W, capital W will be equal to capital W prime. Okay, so we can solve this model very easily. Okay, and of course, we discount these transitions as well by 1 plus r. Yeah? Is s either 0 or 1? Or no, s, s, a s is a probability, right? So s is a number like 0 0.02 per, per month, empirically. But it can be whatever you want, as long as it's a, it's a valid probability, OK? Similarly, if you're unemployed, what happens? Well, you, you're, you're sitting on this, in the state of unemployment. You're not too happy because the wage is higher than B. That's a, that's a, comes out of the model. Um, but you do get B, and B is the value of your leisure. And then you can make a transit, a transition to work and get W prime. Okay? Or you, you're unlucky and you, you're still looking. But it's not the end of the world. Time repeats. It's like Groundhog Day. It keeps repeating. <laughs> right? And if the firm's perspective, the same thing. The firm gets your productivity, but it has to pay your wage. And the wage we haven't determined yet. But given that the wage will be determined in this Nash bargaining process, it's really easy to get the, get the answer. The firm can be unlucky, 
and it loses uh, the match. The match is terminated exogenously with, at rate s. Then you have, you're, you're looking for a job again. You're, you're out in the vacancy world. Or you manage to keep producing with the same worker that you got in the bathtub, but you found them, and you keep it for, with probability 1 minus s. OK, and all that's left is to describe the firm. If the firm is looking, the firm has to pay something. The firm has to advertise the vacancy. It has to interview workers, et cetera. So you have this flow cost of being in the vacancy stage, unfilled vacancy stage. OK, so you just haven't found somebody. You have to pay C, so that's a minus. And you pay that at the end of the period. Now, we said that the probability of finding a match is Q. Right? But I told you before that Q and F are related, so I'll do something special in a second. 1 minus Q is the probability of still being in the vacancy mode afterwards. So you see this is like four equations in the valuation of the asset. And if I tell you that, that the prime values are equal to the unprime values, then we can close the model. We still don't have a formula for the wage yet, but I can substitute. So before, after. I substituted away from F. So the, there's no change. This is equal to f, and this is 1 minus f. But you can see I've basically reduced the entire model to theta. Right? It's labor market tightness, and all we have to do is figure out how that feeds back into the wage, and then we're done. OK, so I'm finished. Um, just, just by way of an introduction, just to get you, because if you don't like this stuff, then we won't see each other anymore. That'll be fine. But I want to. You know, this is where we're going. The, the course will get much more intense. And if you want to see, visit the Moodle site and look at the, uh, or, or the YouTube videos and check out the, um, the, um, the level of mathematical um, intensity that we reach. It's not that bad, but it'd certainly be a bit more than this. Um, key concepts, unemployment, three perspectives, participation, labor force, three states of the labor market, which is not the same thing as three perspectives. We're going to be dealing with two perspectives in the flow model. And then the Pissarides model would say that um, we can explain capital gains and losses by looking at the transitions. So the big, the big thing to think about is S, little s, and little f. And we showed in the Pissarides model, little f is equal to theta times q. So it's all going to be about this theta, right? And that comes through the matching function and constant returns to scale. OK, great. Thanks for coming. And uh, Thomas, we'll see you uh, at the end of the week. And have a great week.